anything that we can answer that um, maybe we've touched on or that we haven't touched on. Uh, so I'm going to let Terry Wittick read one of her poems. So last night I had this dream. It was cold and it was really, really dark. And I'd been asleep, but something had woken me up. I could hear a sound like waves on the beach and a sound like a train. Then it seemed like there were people outside the house. The waves were people trying to get in, and the train was something bad coming. So I woke up the children. We've got to get out. I took them down the basement. The furnace hummed. I said, we're going to escape through this. It was one of those old coal-burning furnaces. You know, there was a little shovel for coal, I think, and a door with raised silver lettering. The door was heavy, but I pulled it open, and I sent my first son in. With face leaned down close, so hot, I waited until I couldn't see him anymore. Then I sent in my daughter. She was still a little sleepy. I put her into the flames feet first, and they ruffled orangey red at the hem of her gown. She started running. I waited. When I couldn't see her anymore, I climbed in with the baby. And now Susan. Um, this is radio dedication to her kinswoman. We used to take over the highest bleachers above the Sunday backbeat of tennis on clay courts, above azaleas and clouds of family, murmuring home, vodka, dinner, Disney, bonanza. You and I rested in the fiery blue opal of late afternoon. Aretha sang Natural Woman on my pink vinyl radio, turned low so only we could hear, as we spun our folklore. Kisses, fingers, cars, nights when at last we would feel the stars swell and breathe on each other, breaking into dream palominos fast enough to get us to the next dimension. Our fragrance attracted tall palms, their fat scarlet seeds like valentine acorns caught in our hair and fell around our feet. You wore heaven scent and I wore ambush. We waited for sundown, radio rhythms blurred our dizzy thighs. I was the first, I ran to you like a hunting dog and threw the prize of carnal knowledge down between us. Your admiration was rimmed with green, your gray eyes with pity. How many centuries we groped in darkness before fire, before incandescence, before gaslight, before candles. Just think what Mother Night has seen. And despite the gradual ascendance of human vision, the next morning I could not look my mother in the eye. Oh, daylight, your true blonde boyfriend. You pushed yourself toward a horizon that seemed more golden. You looked down from a vessel I could not swim to. Then it was my turn to pity you as you drifted toward the shoals, smiling for the camera, your tiara silly as a peacock's crest, your corsage dripping orchid light over your unsheltered heart. And now the fabulous Terry Thaxton. Mm. The woman. You think you see her in the distance, arms crossed over her chest, a rabbit on each shoulder, another rabbit curled in the nook of where her elbow would be. You are sure she must have eyes. You're not supposed to see them or that thin veil covering her face, a veil draped over her antlers. Antlers she wishes to be horns. She wants to be cruel. How can she be the devil 
when she is covered in pink flowers. Anyway, she is always missing. Do the earrings give her away? They dangle like grapes on chains, and her mouth doesn't move, even when someone else tries to add her to the scene. One rabbit has a bow around its neck. Looking back, she's sure this started when she was a girl. She'd stand at the counter to order hamburger, french fries, soda, but the, can I help you, was meant for the person behind her. She stood, became the wind rushing out the door, flying into adulthood. Still, no one sees her. The clouds are as real as her dress. The sky holds up the rabbits at her shoulders. Rabbits are visible. She is not. She is trying to not let you see the eye of the flowers she wears as rings. Eyes instead of pistols, identical to the eyes of the rabbits. All those eyes. Okay, so we're going to start with a um, um, question I'm going to ask my um, two sister poets. Um, what is the most dangerous word for you to use in a poem or in poetry? I think one that I haven't, you know, it's always good to have words that you don't know how to use because it means there's still so much to learn, you know? I have a real time, hard time talking about nation or country um, or the US um, in a sort of larger sense. I can say Sandusky, Ohio, where I'm from. I can say Lake Erie. I can say Sandusky Bay, the gray cracking ice. You know, I have no trouble with that part of it. But when I try to talk about the nation, um, I don't, I don't think that the words fail. I think I fail the words. Well, <clears throat> I think any abstraction is the most dangerous word. But there's sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to use an abstraction. I had a poem recently where I used the word love. Oh, my God. <laughs> like the <laughs> most taboo of all abstractions to use. But it was the only word that would fit in that spot, in that line. And I'm happy with the way it turned out, but I can't believe I, you know. Mm -hmm. And the other words are the ones that I, I you overuse. Mm -hmm. um, the words gold and peacock. And in fact, the poem I just read, there was a peacock in it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many peacocks are in my poems, <laughs> along with motor vehicles of all kinds. <laughs> so it's really, <laughs> it's weird. I, it's, when something becomes that much of a pattern, it's just like, you know, you got to have a peacock-free poem now. <laughs> so, I won't say it's a dangerous word because I like peacocks, obviously. But um, you know, the abstractions are really the bad bugaboos. It's kind of like when you're, you know, when you start out writing and you want to spew all your feelings on the page, and that's that's usually where it's, if you can get past the abstractions. So, yes. Yes. So I w uh, we came up with these questions, and um, I tried to think about what is the most dangerous word for me to use in poetry. And I think it is always the word um, that I find myself using over and over again at that particular time, whatever time period is, because um, our psyches are, you know, we go through obsessions. And so whatever I'm obsessed with is a word that shows up all the time. So I'm always trying to stay away from that word, whatever it happens to be. Um, right now, woman is a in big, big repetition in my work. <laughs> uh -oh. but, but I did notice that both of, uh, that all three of us, we didn't know which poems we were reading today, but I did notice that we had a theme, <laughs> that uh, we, we all read poems about the experience of being uh, female. So I will start with a more targeted question to Terry Wittick down the way. Now, if you're familiar with Terry's work or have been to any of her 
uh, readings, which are really more like performances. I'm, I'm really fascinated with the way her work over time has become more visual, where the visual and the verbal are combined, which absolutely fascinates me. Um, I feel kind of trapped in a different, I, it, it, I'm always interested in how people put the visual with the verbal, so I have, to, I have this to ask you. I can remember my question. <laughs> so when you're generating material for a brand new piece mm. um, that's going to combine visual or even experiential with the verbal, um, do you conceive it as one thing and then it grows into another? Mm -hmm. um, or uh, does, it, does it start out as a hybrid? Um, what comes first, the written or the visual or the experiential? Well, since I work with actual visual artists, I would never claim to to be a visual artist. But I have these things that just sort of ask me to try to do something with them. And okay, so I'm at Michael's, and there are rows and rows of ribbons, and I am compelled, for some unknown reason, to buy several shades of, of these rib ribbons, which I have in my closet. And then I finally wrote the poem about this horrible dream I had with my children getting into the furnace. And then I realized I had to follow my children into the fire dream. So I don't know how you describe that. I'm going to have to leave that to my, <laughs> some grad student somewhere can talk about this. But I, I was very, I had to buy the ribbon and then something else happened. Um, I don't know. I think it works differently for you too, right? With different things, you start to one way and then something else happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's why I think why we, I think that's what's the, driving force behind poetry is that there's always a surprise. There's always something, you know, I never start with an idea. I never start with, I never know what my poems are gonna be about. Um, and so it's always that surprise that I'm after. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Actually, I think it's probably my turn to ask you something, Terry, since mm -hmm. you mentioned that we were all um, women writing about being women somehow at some inescapable level. Um, where do you think autobiographical poetry is going in our country right now? I mean, there's so many different types of poetry and poetics, as you know. There's just such, it's such a wonderful time in our world. It really is. And if you're unhappy, there's another group of people in the next corner doing something else that you will be happier with. Um, but as somebody who's really perfected, you know, the art of the autobiographical in her poetry, what do you think is happening? And are you happy with it? Do you want something else to happen? Mm. First, let me pick myself up from that compliment. That was <laughs> really nice. Um, yeah, it turns out that some of my poems are autobiographical, or at least uh, big chunks of them are. Um, where do I think it's going? I think it's going in a really exciting um, direction. I'm reading, I can tell you, a, maybe it's just the books that I'm reading or that, that I'm drawn to these particular books, but I'm reading Fanny Says by Nicole Brown, which is um, pretty thick for a book of poetry. Um, Boa Limited just put it out um, a couple of years ago. And um, as I said, the book is called Fanny Says, and what Nicole Brown does is writes from the perspective of her grandmother, who was a very um, colorful, colorful grandmother, really wild character. And um, the poems tell her story through uh, the poet Nicole Brown. I also just finished reading Gog by Brandy George. She's a brand new young poet. Um, I think she might have just finished uh, her PhD at FSU. Uh, and so what I'm, and then Rochelle Hurt, oh, what's her book called? Oh, The Rusted City. What I'm seeing is, at least in these books that I'm reading, is sort of this blend of the autobiographical reality with magic realism or um, sort of an imagined reality. And that's what I really like about mm -hmm. it is that it's, using what I remember as true and then mixing it with some surreal or dreamlike 
images to, so that it creates its own f storyline, its own way of autobiography, mm -hmm. its own sense, its own sense. Yes, um, because in poetry you don't have to tell the absolute truth. Exactly. It's not like nonfiction, so yay. Yeah, you get, to, <laughs> you get to say, like Sharon Old says, you know, none of her poems are autobiographical, which is what she says. Huh? <laughs> um, so we get to hide behind our poetic mask. Well, we get to lie and tell the truth at the same time. Exactly. Because you know, they all tell the truth. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so, Susan, um, yes. could you talk about the element of surprise in writing poetry, both in individual poems, perhaps, and also in your longer evolution as a poet. Like, what has surprised you about where you are now as a poet, um, based on, in opposed to what you were as a poet, what you were writing 10 to 15 years ago? Okay. I, you know, I know it's a corny, who said it? If there's no surprise for the reader, or for the writer, there's no surprise for the reader, Robert Frost. Um, cause Often when you start out to write something, I know this is true for every poet I know, so I don't even need to ask. You think it's going to be about one thing, and then it's totally about something else if you just keep writing. Um, you cannot really cage you know, that kind of thing. But um, for, for me, I think you start out really reckless, and you're just trying anything, mm -hmm. and which is a glorious stage in early poetry writing. I mean... It's great. I mean, if I hadn't gone through that stage, I don't think I would be able to go back into it now because I would have always, because then you start having some success publishing poems and then you, I think your focus gets a little tighter. Like, oh, this is what works for me. This is what, you know, is expected of me as a poet. And then you have to break out of that. So it's a constant, constant process of breaking out. And because I am so autobiographical, I, but I, of course, make, make shit up all the time because, you know, Otherwise, it would just be too unbearable to read the actual facts of the case. So um, when people say to me, did that really happen? I say, well, in my head it did. And of course, there's plenty of truth in the poems. But what happens is, is other things kind of get involved. And I've started using collage techniques to force myself to be surprised. I was at a workshop with Nick Flynn um, a couple of years ago, and he did this exercise that he had gotten from his teacher Carolyn Forche. It's almost like we have these generations of teaching moments, you know, and um, I wrote a poem using collage technique which involved snippets from science articles and two different stories. I was writing about my life and um, what was a 12-page kind of rangy poem um, actually ended up being the poem that I read to you. and. When I was in MFA school, I was in a lot of workshops where people would say to me, well now, you have to decide, is this one poem or two? Because <laughs> I think you're writing two different poems here. And it always just really ticked me off because I would put poems in front of them by great words and say, this poem is about two things, this poem is about two things. And finally I decided, who cares what they think? <laughs> so, um, so that poem, and I, I, I really was able to knit it together with the collage technique. And a lot of that stuff went away. I mean, a lot of stuff I loved went away, but it didn't serve the poem after about the 10 billionth revision. And so um, the collage technique is what's helping me now rough up the surface, surface of, of stories I'm trying to tell. Mm -hmm. And things that catch my ear or my eye, I will import and then kind of mess around with, make it my own or not, and and I, I really recommend it as a way of, of breaking out of patterns. Um, so that's, I've, I've had to kind of resort to surprising myself with all kinds of tricks mm -hmm. um, and writing things down that don't seem to have any bearing on the poem I'm writing, but then later on, you know, and Laura Kosishka, a poem I really, a poet I really admire, she talked about how she kept it in her writing notebook she would write things down that caught her attention for whatever reason. And she would just close the book and then write more another day and close the book, hoping that in her absence they would all start talking to each other. And sometimes that really works. Another way of surprising yourself. Mm -hmm. so. And I believe it's my turn to ask a question. So 
Terry Thaxton. <laughs> oh, it's a good thing their names are spelled differently, at least, so I know who I'm asking. Um, so like, like you, I am really interested in that slippery space between um, lyric essay and poetry. Very, very interested. I've had a few good, good pieces of luck with that, with a failed poem. I've turned it into a lyric essay, and oh, now somebody wants it. So, um, and then I think, well, I like it better that way. So um, how do you deal with this kind of thing when you are labeling something for submission? I mean, just in practical terms, a lot of literary magazines are, are way ahead of us on this, and some are not nearly up to speed. They're like, well, what is it? You know. Mm -hmm. And so how do we deal with the blurred genre lines? How do we deal with it, Terry? Mm. How do you deal with it? Well, Tell how me. do I deal with it? Well, the poem I read today, okay, I've got it in like 16 point font so I can show it to you. So it is a prose poem. I'm calling it a prose poem because it's short. <laughs> <laughs> Two more pages would be a novel. Right. <laughs> right. Um, okay. And um, so I think it depends. To, to answer the practical side of that question, it depends on which literary journal I'm submitting it to, if I'm going to call it a prose poem or a lyric essay. Um, and also probably length. I don't know, maybe. Also in terms of what it does. For example, I don't think I would ever call this poem a lyric essay because it relies too heavily, way too heavily just on image without some of the elements of the lyric essay and the essay itself. Um, I've been really interested in the prose poem and lyric essay for probably the last year and a half. I've taken a couple of courses through um, what was called the Rooster Moans, which I think is a much better title than right now they've, they're calling themselves the Poetry Barn. Um, I like the Rooster Moans much better. Uh, but I took a magic realism um, online poetry workshop from um, them. They have, you know, real established poets teaching the classes. And then I took a, a prose poem course. And then I took a lyric essay course. And they are all sort of blending together. So I got really a nice, nice long list of journals that are publishing those blurred lines. And I just think there's something really magical in not being forced to choose a line break or, or and I sort of do that in the composing stage. Like, like I know that you, I think I've seen you take poems and specifically turn them into mm -hmm. essays. And I've not done that yet. I've just started writing something and um, organically decided if it's going to have line breaks or if it's going to run across the entire page. And I just finished reading um, The Rose Metal Press Guide to Prose Poetry. It's a collection of essays and a, a little bit of an anthology about prose poetry. And then David Shields has a book that I have on my shelf that I'm getting ready to read called Life is Short, Art is Shorter. And of course, he's a nonfiction writer. So I'm really interested in this mm, line between poetry and nonfiction, and does there have to be a line? Um, am I right in guessing how you? Yeah, and I'm, I'm also you know, wondering, my follow-up question is, <clears throat> what about that, that freedom to make things up that didn't really happen exactly, especially if it's an event you're telling about? Mm. Once, you're, once you call it an essay, Mm -hmm. I mean, I've I've gone back and made sure every word was true, just because I was so nervous about being, you know, sent to the principal's office or something. Like if mm -hmm. I didn't follow that rule, but um, does that ever come into your mind? Because as poets, mm -hmm. we're so used to having this free-ranging reality. Yes, I think it does. I think for me, it does. Um, when I'm, so I, that's one of the ways I would label is I would like this is a prose poem. It's got some elements of autobiography in it, but for the most part, it's a completely made up thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, it's me. Good answer. Should we ask each other questions still, or should we ask them? Oh, let's questions, see. Or what do you think? It's 404. Four, four. You want to, uh, let's see. 
All right, do you want to ask us some questions? Yeah, we may not be talking about anything you're interested yeah, in. So yeah, you yeah. Can <laughs> rather hear what you can ask. What do you want to know? Yeah. We'll tell you. Mm. Um, I've just started a new MFA in this in my school, <laughs> uh, and I'm team teaching it with a Brazilian visual artist. Um, and so the students are doing everything from making Snapchat poetics to doing nonfiction with historical images to city mapping to performance to whatever. I really believe this is the way. It's not just my way. I, I mean, I'm a lot happier, let me put it that way. Um, forget this line stuff. So uh, anybody does sound art, anybody does, we actually, somebody's finishing his degree in, uh, at the Chicago Art Institute in fiber, and he's gonna join us in January, and I'm really excited, because think what we could do with somebody that really can work in fabric. So um, yeah, sorry it's low res, I mean it's great it's low res, but you need a job and it's expensive, but anybody that wants to do this, come see me, I am committed to this. Thank you. Can I like pay you for asking that question? Yeah. <laughs> it is hard to know where to submit, but I just, I don't tell anybody. I submit everywhere. I submit the same thing under art or under poetry or under essay, and I said, let them figure it the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? There's a lot mm -hmm. of times there's a, too many poetry submissions in those journals, and there are not enough art submissions, and the art is bad. So if you do some sort of um, acemic writing, writing that can't be read, that looks like art, or you know, it, you have to pick the right journal. But there are more journals now that do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed more journals taking, you know, steps and doing special sections for stuff like that. Yeah. And it's like kind of, so yeah, it's growing. Onward. I'm teaching a, gr a graduate uh, workshop this semester that's poetry and nonfiction. And I was asked by the UCF Art Gallery director if my class would participate in uh, this project called Do It, which was she gave us an, an art prompt, a visual art prompt. And then me and my students, the prompt was more vague than any writing prompt I've ever seen in my life. Um, we had to find a photo of a stranger which is hard because Goodwill outlawed, uh, they don't leave photographs in their frames anymore. So we had to figure out how to find a photograph of a stranger. Um, and then we had to write a, we carried that photograph around with us for several weeks. And then we wrote something in response to that and created some sort of visual for it. And we just did our installation last week. It's now, it's currently on display in the art gallery at UCF through March 4th. So I'll plug that. Um, um, but we did, um, some of us did um, a collage of words and um, different art materials. Um, I used an old window frame, a window frame that had been pulled out of a dilapidated house <clears throat> and made it an, into a shadow box and then I did some erasure poetry in it and then pulled mm -hmm. the found poem out of that. and. Um, <clears throat> The erasure poem I created from an article um, on Wikipedia. <laughs> I looked up children's deaths in the 1800s, and so I printed out that article, and then I did an erasure poem with that. I think this is definitely the way it's going um, with all sorts of mixing of everything. Yeah, for me, it's partly political. I want to, um, I, I've started doing work on and with and through Facebook. Um, yeah. uh, the mirror poetry. Oh, good, she's not. Um, <laughs> this is another one of those things. So my mom died, and this was laying on her dresser, and I said, oh, I want this her boudoir set you know we were dividing up stuff and they're like oh yeah take the boudoir set and so I flipped it over and my mother had had on her dresser for years and I didn't realize there was nothing in this mirror so my Facebook project is when I get the feeling I should fill the mirror I fill the mirror and I take a picture of it and I just post it on Facebook and I say materiality empty mirror slash something I've been doing it for two years 
um, people who have never read a single one of my poems come up to me and say, I keep thinking of things I'd fill the mirror with. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know? Yeah. I, you know, there's another poem in my new book, Body Switch, that is all things that people told me on Facebook um, that were about addresses. And I just named the addresses. I don't say anything they said. And so, I mean, I, I just think that we're, there's no point in being afraid about this world. I mean, there are lots of reasons to be afraid, right? It's a, it's, it's a nightmare, but it's not about making work. We shouldn't be afraid about making work. We should be afraid about the world, right? Um, so, you know, why, why get bent out of shape about where you're gonna send it? You know, we're sending stuff out every day. Why not use the social media? I'm also doing a smartphone project with Matt Roberts that's gonna be at the Orlando Museum of Art starting in uh, May. Uh, he had very nicely invited us along, but we're doing things where you text seven word dreams into your phone, and then you're gonna see them floating in the air in the museum. And they're renewable. It's a renewable garden. It's called Dream Garden. <laughs> and you can keep remaking this community garden. And that, for me, is political, too. Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you for Yeah, that. better than ours to each other. Keep Boy, asking. Yeah, ask me something else. We were kind of like boring. Yeah. <laughs> Colleen? Writer's practice. I'm always asking questions about how do you find balance. So what, what practices mm. do you have to make sure that you, uh, uh, when you write? Hmm. Uh, mm. <sighs> <laughs> I, I have to compartmentalize and my life is not conducive to writing. I teach at a secondary school. I'm, you know, I love it, but I'm really too busy to write. I don't know how I do it. I do have a group of poets, just a few of us, and I know you're going to freak out when I tell you this. We meet every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Wow. wow. Why? Because it's the only time in the week we know wow. all four of us will have. Right. It's the only time. And you're your ticket for admission is a new piece of something. So often it's written two in the morning on Saturday, you know, it's like, so be it. It's like people drag themselves in going, this sucks, by the way. It's like, yeah, well, that's what you said last time, but it's, it actually gets, it starts pieces. And in my life, that's, that's how desperate it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know when I used to teach at UCF, I kind of took for granted I would have like two days a week to prepare for class and, but I've switched jobs and it's been a real trying, it's been a terror ever since to try to, but, but I don't know, I kept writing somehow, but not enough. Mm -hmm. I'm years behind, but that's okay too. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel, I'm years behind. I feel like I started late and you know, um, I didn't publish my first book till after I was 50, um, but who cares, you know, like, I don't care. <laughs> okay, great. That got published. Um, I have several uh, tricks, you know, since I found the rooster moans and they're like really interesting young poets teaching these classes. I'm all about learning from what the newer poets are doing. And so um, that it just gives me a deadline when I am taking a class from them. It's like, a four-week course and you write a piece a week they give you a prompt blah, blah blah plus you learn a whole lot of they have nice long lectures and all that but when I'm not taking a class like that I have a friend we have a commitment to each other so you could find either mm -hmm. a group or a, or a, a writing buddy mm -hmm. and um, our group is called tater tot and um, ours is called swing set girls oh, we're <laughs> tater, -tot, tater tot casserole that's what we are <laughs> Um, we owe each other five pages of poetry on the first of every month. We return those five pages with feedback on the 15th, and so it goes, and so it goes. Um, and, um, you know, I started writing when I was a single parent with a special needs child. Um, <laughs> I was teaching secondary school. Um, I now teach at UCF, so I have a little bit more freedom, although they do keep piling more on us, but... Um, you know, it just becomes, um, yeah, if you have to write at two in the morning, you have to write at two in the morning. And, um, or sometimes, like, I'll, the, I mean, one of the reasons I gave my class that assignment uh, that I told the art gallery director, yes, we'll do that, was because then I 
you know, gave myself an assignment. Oh, I'm going to have to do it too. And so, how about you? When do you? You know, I don't know. I I I hang out with these fiction writers who are so great. They they say you know you just have to put your butt in the chair every day and you know just ah oh, man. And it makes me feel guilty, like a, you know, like I'm a bad wood Catholic, which I was um, too, and, <laughs> and a horrible Protestant, which I also was. So I mean, I, you know, I can't. I have to have a certain kind of emotional space to write. It's not just physical time. I mean, sometimes I want to just lay there and watch, you know, uh, you know, Korean dramas on TV. I mean, really. Um, so I can't. I don't. I don't know. I do know that. When I haven't made work for a certain amount of time, I start to feel crazy. It's like when I haven't, I, you know, I'm also sort of a workout person, and when I haven't worked out, I feel crazy, you know. So, um, yeah, but it. I used to think, uh, you know, I got up at five and I would write every day and all that. I get up at five, I watch the light come up in the trees, I finger the coffee. I don't know what I do, <laughs> I don't know. But I give myself two hours to do it every morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else do you guys want to know? I also give myself a, like my my uh, some of my poetry research. If I can't, yeah, uh, like you have this wonderful thing. Like thrift stores are my hangout yeah. spot, mm -hmm. and I'll go to the thrift store and buy you know some. I know that I'm going to buy something, not something big, something little and um, maybe something big sometimes, because I bought that window, mm -hmm. which was so cool. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go get some more windows. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, so yeah, just taking time to look at yeah. old things, new things, things that aren't in my normal world. And thinking, thinking is, is, I mean, we're so, in the US, we're so product driven, you know? It's like, it's like we're not working if we're walking around and just looking out of our eyes. We are privileged to be able to walk around and look out of our eyes. I mean, we know that. Um, but I don't see why everything has to turn into product so darn quickly. Um, at least I, my work is terrible when I try to do it too quickly. You know, other people yeah. can. You know, it Sylvia Plath time. lasts three days of her life. Jesus, you know, but right. not me. Well, if you gave yourself three days, you could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you said three days, three days, then it's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is a challenge. What else do you guys want to know? What other questions? I just wondered about revision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> revision. 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 Mm. Do you think it's, mm. it's time. You know, just what, you, what what Terry was saying, if you try to rush it, and I've tried, and then I, I've, I've even published stuff that I just, um, it kills me because there's so many things I want to change. So art takes time, you know, and it's just like sometimes the rare moment, we've all had those where it just falls out almost completely done, and it's like, whoa, this thing is complete. But I just think you have to like disconnect and then reconnect again and you'll just see it differently and I just I guess that time limit is different for everyone but I think revision is so important you, you you just have to give yourself that time or you'll never see things that later you're just oh was I crazy I you know this because it's too important to get to get it down and not hate it because mm -hmm. you know that feeling of like oh this sucks I hate it I'm stopping <clears throat> you can't do that either you have to keep going but then you have to be willing to put it aside and come back and see what's there that you missed and that what where it can grow that you missed. And so time, time, time. Not convenient for today's world, but there you have it. Mm -hmm. That's my view anyway. Yeah. Do you guys like to revise? It helps if you like it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you can see it getting better. That really helps. If you don't like it, just start bringing something else that you'd like gonna like revising if you're in it for that first burst of love okay but you know just only show those to your mom you know because because the first burst of love is just is is just a, a 
well, it's chemical, it only lasts three months. I, mean, I, I don't know, but, it, <laughs> 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 but, but you know, the real work of revising, if you can learn to like that, it just is such a help to you as a writer, right? Because then there's always hope. Yeah. Yeah. There's not, it's not failure, it's hope. And the other thing that helped me was to think that I wasn't writing a poem. I was writing one long thing, <laughs> like a life, you know, <laughs> little pieces were going to come out, and I was going to be able to remake those in a way that would work. Um, and then just also flushing the failures. There's sort of kind of a, if you can learn to be relieved to get rid of the failures instead of thinking of them as, you know, it's kind of a relief to say, oh man, that just sucks out. You know, at least it shows you've got some judgment. You know, your therapist would approve. Mm -hmm. I used to have a strategy for a revision, but now I don't. I, now it's just time and f flushing and being okay with, I mean, I think when I first started writing, because I did start writing late, which I thought, I thought it was late. Now, now looking back, I was, I was young, but, <laughs> but I didn't start writing until I was in my 30s. And so I was in a big hurry. And, um, but I've slowed down and, um, um, and mysteriously enough, um, I write more in, in the slowing down, I, mm. you know, and the not rushing to try to get something great on the page first, just kind of the slowing down and just enjoying the process. And revision is the part I love much more than the original. Generating. Generating, yeah. yeah. It's like giving birth, you know, the giving birth part is a pain, but the, wiping off the afterbirth and cleaning up the thing and dressing it <laughs> that's the fun part that's the fun part for me what else what other questions do you have yes i probably demonstrate what i don't know about art form by asking the question but uh, most of you come from academia you teach poetry mm -hmm. uh, do you find yourself restricted by rules and form and format or do you sometimes just throw it all away B. But I teach literature, which I vastly prefer to teaching writing. I know that that's kind of an unpopular view, but I'd much rather wallow in great writing with my students than try to suffer through their <laughs> writing. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> I know. Bad teacher. Bad teacher. God, thank God none of my students are here. But. <laughs> It's just, it hurts me, you know? I'm just like, oh, I know you're gonna, oh, but when, you know, when somebody really shows some promise, it's fabulous, yeah. but often it's just my feelings, you know? And I just, oh, I just can't even. But the more I read and the more I, I, I feel like I'm kind of a missionary, that I'm, I'm turning them into readers that will seek out the unusual, the new, I'm gonna make them aware of places to look for reading unusual stuff they've never thought of in their lives and you know and for that you know that's good so I get to I get to when I'm interested in something I I show them too so teaching actually helps me to explore more and also to in my own work to let go of other things I might have considered well this is a poem or this is how it has to be so it's freeing yeah, I never thought I was going to finish college. I got married at 19 and had three children by the time I was 25. And um, I just sort of ended up, um, you know, I was re really restless, but I, I ended up, you know, my first time, I can't talk about this without drinking, but um, <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. But I'm just going to say I just ended up, um, you know, it looks like I have this really Tony degree because I ended up at Vanderbilt, but literally they scraped me off the street in Nashville and gave me a, a, a free ride and um, then kept me for, for graduate school. I mean, you know, what, what, what were my options? I mean, literally, the only thing else I can do is, you know, back in the day, it was I was a very good breastfeeder. And <laughs> <laughs> I like reading aloud. I mean, you know, like I got two skills. <laughs> Crackhorn yeah. Vegas, that would have been me. So, 
So I'm serious. I, I, I am so grateful that I ended up, I can't believe I have a job in a university. And my husband, too, is from a lower middle class background, and he's, he is likewise astonished. He's a university professor. He teaches comic books, which were a hobby he had when he was a kid. So I don't know what ha I don't feel, I feel really, really, really saved. <laughs> saved. So I, I don't feel constricted by it. I feel like I've been given a, a, an amazing thing. And then the fact that I could make up how to do an MFA program in any way I wanted. I mean, partly because nobody really cares about poetry. So nobody's stopping us, That's you right. know? You can do whatever the hell you want. <laughs> you know what want. I mean? People give you all <laughs> kinds of shit for nonfiction. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but a lot of fiction fiction can be really boring. Um, <laughs> Because a lot of it is still sort of caught up in realism, I think, and which I don't think is the most interesting mode, just my personal opinion. But in poetry, we got everything. We've got everything in this crazy time that we live in, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, no, I feel nothing but blessed. I don't feel, uh, I love every day when I get a first generation college student in my classes. Mm -hmm. But I don't yeah. care. If you're a good writer, I will love you anyway. Or if you're just kind of nice, I also will love you. Yeah. <laughs> Be willing to read. Also, the great uh, thing, the f very freeing thing about poetry is we know we're not going to have a movie made from our book. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. We don't live in the delusion. Hollywood is calling any minute. That okay. we're going to make a lot of money. Or any. And it's very, or any. <laughs> What's the most yeah. you ever made on a royalty Terry mirror? Terry gives away her poetry mirror on Facebook for free. You know, we, we, uh, we don't, like, I do see a lot, I, I direct the MFA program at UCF, and I do see a lot of people come through the fiction who, you know, they're going to make millions with their novels, and great, I'm so happy for them. But I'm also so happy for my poetry students and my not most of the nonfiction students I think are feel this way as well too that you know we're really in love with the right I'm not saying anything bad about fiction writers because they're you know I love in fact I read as much fiction as poetry but um, I just have seen this um, notion that that you're somehow going to make a lot of money from a novel and that happens to for some people and yay, um, but poets aren't, you know, I think we just love words. Yeah, I had someone actually ask me, like, how much money did, would you say, you know, <laughs> I guess you have to supplement with teaching. It was like, <laughs> 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 it's like so they said, well, what, since you're a writer, can't you just, why don't you just write a cookbook or something? They sell well. And I was like, so. Yeah. You know, the world doesn't really see it sometimes the way writers do. Yeah. yeah. And yet, you, every, you know, you got to have a job and make money and put food on the table. You got to do it, you know. So, I mean, everybody's got to figure that out because it is a privilege to be able to write without, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Paging Billy Collins. Yeah. <laughs> God love him. Yeah. <laughs> So how much is the most you ever made on a royalty year? Let's tell them the truth. Royalties from poetry? Yeah, there you go. I made $173 once. It's my fifth book of poems. It's just come out. And the editor said, we made $70 last year, and I'm going to plow it into your production costs. Hmm. I don't think I've made any royalties. but. I won a contest and a Florida Arts Fellowship oh, yeah. one year, mm -hmm. and it really screwed up my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like all these thousands of dollars from poetry, and it was just like, and then I had to tell them the next year I didn't make anything, and they were like, is this some sort of a hobby? It's like, <laughs> you say that word to a writer, and they're, it's like their brains burst into flames. <laughs> you know? It's like... And the really great thing is, is when you pick up with other people that don't make any money, like the experimental sound people I hang out with. I mean, literally nobody can make any money. It's almost like a point of pride. And I think it's a false pride. You know, it would be nice to make some money, wouldn't it? I mean, you know. But it, we're kind of prideful about it. Oh, it's cultural capital we have or something like yes. that. <laughs>
<laughs> and the fiction writers are a little scared of us, right? Because we don't make money, we're somehow like pure or something. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How do you figure out where to send your poetry? Or how That's a good question, because it changes all the time. Yeah. What, what kind of poetry do you write? Like yours. Sorry. Like, <laughs> <laughs> is our lasers flashing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good poetry. <laughs> Laser poetry. <laughs> uh, we need you in our MFA. Um, so there's a lot of good online journals that do multimodal stuff, and one of them is called a Bad Penny Review um, that is... Uh, that you should look at. It's really cool. The editors are um, young. They're in, in graduate school at University of Georgia. They're just getting out. Um, they have a PhD program in, in experimental um, writing. Uh, so, so that's a really good one. Um, what's, what are some other good ones for? Uh, Radar Poetry is a fairly new online journal, and I love online because you know, it's so instantaneous, and you know they often incorporate art too. They will get an artist on to maybe do something in response to your piece, which is really interesting. And you know, they're from Cal they're out of California, but they're a new one that I like. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and don't let the old journals off the hook. I say, no. you know, send them to poetry, make them up their game. My son who's a fiction writer just got some diagrams that he's labeled in different ways, accepted at Poetry Magazine. Wow. Oh, yeah, cool. and it's not a special issue. They, he got the same stuff and it accepted as fiction in the rumpus, poetry in poetry. I mean, you know, um, so I, I think it's a good idea. He even had somebody say, you know, I'm sorry, but we've decided, we love this, but this is, we've decided that we can't quite go in this direction, meaning they felt like they should. So why not push the places? I mean, don't be ignorant. You got to read the journal, you know, or read the online. You can't just assume, but um, other than that, let them see, what, let them see what's out there. Yeah, I'm real excited about where contemporary poetry is mm -hmm. going, well, what we're doing. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great place to be. It's a great time yeah. to be a poet, it despite is. the no money thing. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. So I think we're um, at the uh, end of our time, and we just wanted to thank you very much for coming and listening to us. And talking, and, and with, talking us. with us. And Thanks. caring about poetry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.